All right, we can finally compare Wonder Woman to what should be another good solo female superhero movie. Now, I'm just going to mention right off the bat, I am aware that there is a culture war going on with Captain Marvel, and no, I am not going to just ignore it. I am going to address it head on in this comparison, as well as discuss how devious and manipulative the media and studio were for letting this get out of hand the way it did. That being said, I still have a job to do, and I will reserve my personal views on this controversy for the conclusion segment of this versus video. That also being said, if the deliberate feminist directions this movie takes actually compromises the film's story and characters in any negative way, I will call it out directly and address it. And make no mistake, this is a feminist movie. Brie Larson confirmed it, the directors confirmed it, and it's not something that people are making up. This film was intentionally written and directed as a feminist movie. So with that being said, it's time to find out which of the two movies did a better job at giving a female superhero their first solo outing in their respected universe. Let the battle commence. What's interesting about the stories for both of these movies is that they are both told in an older time period. The story for Wonder Woman takes place during the First World War, which is very ballsy as most movies keep playing it safe and keep going to World War II, and the story for Captain Marvel takes place in the 90s. Yeah. Now something you might have noticed is that Wonder Woman chose a time period that provides unique storytelling opportunities, and Captain Marvel chooses a time period which is really used as a means to make a bunch of 90s references and jokes about how slow the technology was at the time. But there's never a point when this 90s technology becomes a hindrance for our characters. It's not even used to up the tension in a scene. It always gets the job done and the characters never get into danger because of it. So right off the bat, unlike Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel makes very poor use of his time period. Anyway, time period aside, what are the actual stories for both of these movies? Well, the story for Wonder Woman opens in a place called Themyscira. We are introduced to a little girl called Diana who we see grow up into adulthood. One day, she randomly sees a man drowning in the ocean and she rescues him, not knowing the Germans are on his trail. After the Amazons battle them off, they question Steve Trevor and he reveals that he has stolen the evil Dr. Poison's notebook that contains her research for her toxic gas, and if he delivers it to the British intelligence then the war will be over. After he describes the war, Diana believes that it is being instigated by Ares, and if she kills him, then she can rid the world of all evil. She makes a deal with Steve Trevor that if she takes him off the island, then he will take her to Ares. He agrees, and from here, the two characters embark on a journey to stop the war, and as she gets nearer to her goal, she realises that the situation is not as black and white as she thought. And the story for Captain Marvel is based around a character called Carol Danver- I mean, Veers, who lives on the planet Hulla and she is a part of this elite Star Force military called the Kree, and the Kree are undergoing a war with another race of aliens called the Skrulls. Now Veers has amnesia, and as the movie goes on, she starts to remember small pieces of her life before she lost her memory, one of those being the realization that her name is, in fact, Carol Danvers. I don't know why the filmmakers thought her name would be a big reveal, because it wasn't. Anyway, Danvers gets captured by the Skrulls, and she escapes by using an escape pod. She crash lands to Earth, bumps into a rookie Nick Fury, and from here, she tries to piece together her identity whilst also trying to stop the Skrulls from invading the Earth. Now, the storytelling for Wonder Woman can be pretty slow and uninteresting at times, mainly during the opening tale that Diana is being told, as well as the rest of her story involving her childhood. The movie really started to take off for me when Chris Pine's character showed up. That's when the movie suddenly finds its energy and the great storytelling of this film starts to take effect. Before that, the movie was just okay. I also love the visual storytelling. Themyscira looks nice and colourful, very much like a holiday resort, but then when they get to London, it looks less colourful and more grimy and dirty. Now being origin movies, both of these films attempt to tell us our hero's story, and whereas in Wonder Woman it is fairly linear, in Captain Marvel's case, a lot of it is done through flashbacks. There are also a couple of scenes where the scrolls are scrolling through her memories and they often stumble upon the wrong ones, and this is one of the ways the movie tries to tell us about Carol Danvers' past. And this technique of storytelling is fine, but Captain Marvel utilises it in a very uninteresting and incoherent way. There is also no intrigue or feeling of excitement when you find out about her past, it should feel rewarding when we dive through our memories, but it isn't. And the fact that they messed up this part of our origin story is really baffling to me. I usually love this mysterious form of storytelling when a character is trying to piece together their identity. I mean, the Bourne movies are infamous for how well they have done this, and if you want to draw a comparison more closer to home, then take the first two X-Men movies. Wolverine is another Marvel character who has amnesia, and we as an audience are discovering more about his past as he does, and it is presented in a very dark and terrifying 
terrifying manner, and the grim colours, the visuals, the disturbing imagery, it's really interesting, and at the same time, frightening to see what happened to him and what made him the superhero he is today. And his origin story concludes very well and is very tragic. Even the more recent Alita Battle Angel managed to tell this story very well. So as old as this concept is, it still works. And as the characters learn about themselves, you are able to go on this journey of self-discovery with them. You are not able to do that with Carol Danvers, as the script and directing is not coherent and well written enough to execute this kind of storytelling. And that's just the problem with our flashbacks. When it comes to the rest of the story the movie is trying to tell, it is just so bland and dull. And as the movie goes on, you start to realise that there isn't much of a story to begin with. A lot of the movie is just padding. Nothing about it feels like it's building up to something of relevance. And out of all the movies in the MCU, Captain Marvel seems to have the least amount of stakes, and without stakes, you don't feel the weight and urgency of the situation. And that really does puzzle me. How on earth can this movie have five writers and somehow manage to come up with such a light and non-existent plot? And if that wasn't enough, the movie actually incorporates certain characters that were in previous Marvel films, and at first I was excited to see how they were going to incorporate them into past movies, but in the end, there was no reason any of them had to be there. They could have been replaced with any other random character and it wouldn't have made any difference to the plot. It honestly feels like they were just there to fool you into thinking that this movie is more deep and complex than it actually is, and they're not fooling anyone. It's so obvious that they are just used as a means to camouflage the fact that not much is going on with the story. They're really are so much narrative problems with Captain Marvel, whereas narratively, Wonder Woman told its story far better. So the movie with the superior story is Wonder Woman. I know Marvel that when you don't have the Russo brothers, story has never been your strong side, but you really dropped the ball with this movie. But do you know what has been your strong side? Say what you will about Marvel's light stories, they really know how to handle their heroes. The Avengers is living proof of that. So, how do they do with Captain Marvel? Well, before I talk about her as a character, let's talk about her strength. Now, for someone who is being touted as the most powerful of the Marvel superheroes, that didn't really come through to me. Some of the stuff that Thor did in Infinity War really stuck in my mind and blew me away with how strong he is, and even some of the stuff Scarlet Witch has done in the past has taken me by surprise. But Captain Marvel's strength was presented in one cool scene where she crashes through a huge ship, and then that's it. That was the extent of her destructive powers, and most of her powers were presented in a very generic way. They were essentially a more glowy version of Iron Man's powers. As a matter of fact, let's go through these one by one. She has super strength, so does Iron Man. She can fire energy blasts from her hands, so can Iron Man. She can fly, so can Iron Man. She can fly and shoot beams from her hands. Well, again, so can Iron Man. None of her powers were visually different or unique when compared to Iron Man's. And also, when she starts to discover her powers, it was completely uninteresting and lacked any creativity. The part where she discovers her flying ability in particular just came out of nowhere. As for her arc, she didn't have one. No, really. The movie spends so much time having characters explain to her how strong, brave and amazing she is that her actual character development is non-existent. That is just inexcusable. And the writers and directors really needed to get off their feminist high horse and take the time to give her an arc. Whenever you are introduced to an origin story, you must see a difference between the character at the beginning of the film and the end of the film. And you must have them learn something or accomplish something that changes them and makes them evolve as a person. And unfortunately, by the end of the movie, she is the exact same character she was when the film started. And after watching her for two hours, I didn't feel like I knew anything about her. Now with Wonder Woman, you constantly see her devotion, but you also see her more human and vulnerable side, whether it be with characters she grows a friendly relationship with, and even the more subtle character moments such as when she walks over to the sound of a crying baby. It all shows you what kind of person she is, and despite being a devoted warrior, she is shown to have a very bubbly personality, as well as being able to smile a lot. With Captain Marvel, you just get the same dull and bored looking expression throughout the whole movie, with some very stiff smiles thrown in. And there's a point where some asshole guy tells her, geez, it wouldn't hurt to smile, or something along those lines. And the movie treats what he said as if it was something negative. And I honestly don't know what they're trying to pull here. Smiling is not a bad thing. It's something everyone should do. But apparently, this movie is trying to make a point that smiling shouldn't be encouraged. And the reason she doesn't naturally smile in this movie is because the directors deliberately made sure that she didn't. The directors actually said that they made that decision very early on and wrote it into the script. The reason being because this is a feminist movie, and the feminists think that a strong female character should be closed off and should not be allowed to smile. 
Again, going back to Wonder Woman, when you take away all her goals, you see that she is a very nice and caring person. And she even becomes emotional and breaks down like a normal human being. This reduces her from being a godlike person and makes her more of a human like us. And that instantly makes her much more relatable. You never get that rich character development with Captain Marvel. Now, there is a moment in every Marvel origin movie where the characters emotionally reach a low point. In Iron Man, it's when Stark realizes that his life's work is being used for war to kill innocents. For Thor, it was when he tried to pick up his hammer thinking it would solve all his problems, but he wasn't able to lift it, meaning he was no longer worthy to his father. And for Captain America, it was seeing the death of his best friend, as well as finding out that everyone he knew was dead after he was frozen in ice for 70 years. And he wakes up in a future that he doesn't even recognize, as well as with people that he doesn't even recognize, and that low point haunts him throughout all of his future movies. I can keep going on and on, but this is essentially what all good superhero origin movies do. They give the hero a low point, something that puts them down, and you watch them either conquer or deal with their emotional demons in their own way, and then find the strength to get back up and become the heroes we know. Now Wonder Woman is also given a low point. Throughout the movie she sees death all around her and she wants to help everyone but there are either times where she can't save everyone or she didn't make it in time and saved no one. And this makes her emotionally break down and she even gets in an argument with the new friends she has made. And in spite of this emotional turmoil, she still powers through and tries to get the job done. Now I'm going to tell you Captain Marvel's low point. There comes a point in the movie where her character finds out that her mentor was actually a bad guy, and all she does is stand in one spot and says, everything I knew was a lie. She is then given a cliched pep talk by a friend as to how much of a badass woman she is, and then, one minute later, she suddenly gets up and her attitude is like, let's go and get the job done. That's it. Really, that was it. Her so-called low point had nothing emotional or sympathetic about it. This is supposed to be the moment you root for the main character, and it fails so bad that it really did cripple the rest of the film. When she went to go and fight, I didn't care, because as well as the failed character development, the lackluster story comes back to play, and at this point in the movie, both the story and hero have failed to deliver, and you are just watching a string of events happen that are completely uninteresting and uninspired. And in spite of all that failed character development, apparently Brie Larson is now making the rounds that she wants to make Captain Marvel gay. How on earth is this making her character any better? It has reached a point now with these feminist movies where the strong female character has become a stereotype. And when you look at the two, Wonder Woman is a character. Captain Marvel is just a stereotype. And whereas Wonder Woman was a cool and well-executed character with a ton of emotion and humanity, Captain Marvel was the complete opposite. And as a result, the movie that has the far better origin story and far superior superhero is Wonder Woman. Now what's interesting about the side characters in Wonder Woman is that the movie actually gives them some backstory and also gives plenty of time to humanize them. One of their backstories was also quite interesting. Me? I am an actor. I love acting. I didn't want to be a soldier. This is actually very historically accurate. Some people were just forced into war even though they had different ambitions. That's just how things were at the time, and the movie perfectly sticks to that theme throughout the entire runtime. And then we have Chris Pine, who plays a spy named Steve Trevor. As a character, he is very charming and likeable, and does his best to educate Diana whilst also trying to prevent her from divulging who she is, as well as helping her to not make a fool of herself. And the two have nice chemistry throughout the movie, and he could have easily been a side character, but the movie goes one step further, and surprisingly, he is in the film just as much as Wonder Woman. And this works to the film's benefit, as he really did make it more enjoyable. I actually can't imagine what the movie would be like without him. And I know I'm jumping the gun a little, but the dialogue between him and Wonder Woman is far more thought-provoking and meaningful than anything Captain Marvel had with Nick Fury. Now I won't go as far as to say they are the best side characters, but they were definitely treated with a lot of respect, and they are far more likeable than I would have expected. As for the side characters in Captain Marvel, the only genuinely good one was Nick Fury. Samuel L. Jackson is one of the most charismatic actors in the business, and he is putting his all into this performance. And the de-aging effects they used on him was amazing. It's also used on Coulson as well, and it was absolutely seamless. I have always been impressed with the de-aging effects that Marvel have been using in their films, and it is better here than it has ever been. Now there is quite a major problem I had with Nick Fury in this film. This movie is based in the 90s, and at this point in time, S.H.I.E.L.D. and even 
and Nick Fury have not seen any superheroes or aliens before. So when Nick Fury sees Captain Marvel and a scroll for the first time, you see his shocked reaction, but a few seconds later, he suddenly just accepts what he sees and is completely on board with everything. And I expected more from Nick Fury's first encounter, as this is supposed to be the catalyst for who he becomes later on. As for the rest of the side characters, I really didn't care about Carol Danvers' friend. It felt like they were really trying to endear you to their friendship, but I have honestly seen so much better, both in and outside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the little girl in this movie, she is not even a character. She is just walking exposition for Carol Danvers. I'm totally serious. There was one scene where she bought Danvers a photo, and she just delivers poorly done exposition for Captain Marvel's backstory. And then, much like what the little girl in Season 5 of The Flash is doing, she'll lecture her parent with cringeworthy parenting advice that no kid would ever give. You shouldn't think about what will happen to you if you go out and fight. You should think about what kind of example you're setting for your daughter. And I'm just paraphrasing here. The scene was actually a lot cornier than that. Kids this young don't talk like that. As a matter of fact, neither do teenagers, not even the mature ones, and I really find this to be a strange writing choice that movies are doing lately. Also, Jude Law is in this movie, and he gave a very good performance, but his character was just generic, and the path he goes down by the end of the movie was really predictable. Now, being an origin story, this film shows us how Nick Fury lost his eye, and it is one of the dumbest explanations I have ever seen. The cat scratched it. Seriously. Now, this brings up something that my brother actually reminded me of. It turns out that the mystery behind Nick Fury's eye has already been mostly explained in The Winter Soldier. I'm not obliged to do anything. Those hostages could have died, Nick. I sent the greatest soldier in history to make sure that didn't happen. Soldiers trust each other. That's what makes it an army. Not a bunch of guys running around shooting guns. Last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. Now that makes you think, wow, what kind of dangerous mission was Fury on that made him lose a freaking eye? And the Winter Soldier gave you a little backstory that sounded pretty cool and even tragic. And then this movie just comes along and treats it like a joke. I mean, Fury isn't even in any pain. How could they miss a detail like this? How could my brother point this out, but the five writers who wrote this movie didn't? And by doing that, they made the Winter Soldier, one of my top three favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe films, a little worse. Because now, anytime I watch this scene, the serious nature of it is is going to be turned into a joke because a freaking cat did it. And that is always one of the worst crimes of a sequel, when it makes the previous movie worse. And I honestly don't know why there was so much hype from early viewers surrounding this cat. We've seen monsters with alien mouths before, so much in fact that people actually make fun of it. But as I said, Captain Marvel does the ultimate sin of making the previous movie worse, and that cat is one of the perpetrators. Heck, this movie doesn't even do anything to compliment the other Marvel films. They don't even plant seeds for Hydra, who would have been around at this time. Also, Captain Marvel makes another continuity mistake. When Nick Fury and Robert Redford's character in The Winter Soldier talk about how they go way back with all this shield work, they give you the impression that they have been doing this for decades, like all the way back in the 70s or 80s, but Captain Marvel has retconned that too, and pretty much says that Nick Fury was just a rookie behind a desk in the 90s, and at this point, he has barely been in the field and has not seen any supernatural creatures or aliens. Not only does this contradict the backstory the other movies have given him, but it also makes Nick Fury much less of a badass, and when you watch the previous movies now and Nick Fury talks about his past, it's going to mean much less now that Captain Marvel Marvel has clumsily changed his backstory. And that's not all. There is, in fact, another plot hole. And as a matter of fact, this plot hole is so big that it really puts this movie's very existence into question. Now, this movie establishes that Captain Marvel is the first superpowered being that has come to Earth, and the Skrulls are the first aliens to come to Earth. Now, that would all be interesting stuff, but who remembers this little confession from Nick Fury in the first Avengers? I'd like to know why S.H.I.E.L.D. is using the Tesseract to build weapons of mass destruction. Because of him. Me. Last year, Earth had a visitor from another planet who had a grudge match that leveled a small town. We learned that not only are we not alone, but we are hopelessly, hilariously outgunned. So apparently, the reason S.H.I.E.L.D. found out that aliens and godly beings exist is because of Thor's first appearance back in 2011. But wait, did Fury forget about the super-powered Captain Marvel and the intergalactic war against the Skrulls and the Kree? So that's another big plot hole that this movie has created. The joys of an origin story is that we as an audience are supposed to look back at the previous movies and be like, Wow, so that's what made this character become like this, or that's how this happened. But if anything, Captain Marvel has done such a horrible job that we are not going to be making connections, we are going to be constantly spotting things in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that do not add up, thanks to this one movie. 
this is just too much. Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D.'s backstory was done so wrong in this film, and I haven't even talked about his overly laid back and jokey personality. The entire movie, Samuel L. Jackson feels like he's playing a completely different character. Very rarely do you feel like you're watching a younger Nick Fury. He gets an action scene in the end, but in most of the movie, it feels like he is downplayed so he doesn't upstage Captain Marvel. The side characters in Wonder Woman, on the other hand, are treated as equals to the main character. She doesn't talk down to them, they each play their part in the movie, and they aren't walking female empowerment propaganda like pretty much all of the side characters in Captain Marvel. So the movie with the superior side characters is Wonder Woman. Okay, now action is not either of these movies' strong points. In Captain Marvel, the first action scene that happened started out okay, but then things got so dark and the camera zoomed in so close that I couldn't tell who was hitting who. And the next action scene, where she fights a bunch of scrolls, had the same problem. She's punching people into walls, and the walls are being smashed, but you can hardly see the damage on the walls because, again, everything is so dark, and there's even some horrible shaky cam in there. And Captain Marvel has a spaceship battle, which honestly felt uncreative and like a lesser version of the same battle in Black Panther. And Black Panther spaceship battle was a lesser version of the spaceship battle in Thor Ragnarok. But in Captain Marvel, they essentially do the exact same climactic spaceship battle from Black Panther, only Nick Fury was in the ship this time. And it was just boring, and like I said, felt like a lesser version of the scene in Black Panther. Marvel need to bring something new to these spaceship battles. It worked very well in Thor Ragnarok, but after that, they have just been getting worse and worse and have not brought anything new to the table. And as for the action scenes in Wonder Woman, you guys already know that I am not overly fond of the action in this movie. It's good, and it serves its purpose, but there was never a moment where the action blew me away or took me by surprise. There are also so many unnecessary slow motion shots. Some were used to good effect, but others were just pointless. The sound effects during the fights weren't as impactful and brutal enough either, and the fight in the climax was unbelievably bad. That being said, visually the action looks great, especially the fight scene in No Man's Land. It looks like it is drenched in World War One's time period with a superhero thrown in, and surprisingly, it doesn't look out of place. And unlike Captain Marvel, everything is well lit and you can always see what is going on. But yeah, with regards to the creativity of the action scenes, I think it could have done with a lot more. But that being said, it was definitely good, and it was undoubtedly much better than the very bizarrely shot action in Captain Marvel. Now in Wonder Woman, you get two villains, Ludendorff and Dr. Poison. And these two are really not that great as villains. They're forgettable, don't have a lot of depth to them, and are all around very disposable. Now something I've always said is that if you have lackluster villains, then at least make them do something. And these guys actually gas a whole village. I honestly didn't think a couple of low-level villains like this would do something like that. And this actually played a part in developing Wonder Woman's character, and it made you more engaged in the overall story. And this was actually a very good and smart move, as the villains' actions benefited the characters and the storytelling. So although these villains are pretty naff, I gotta give credit where credit is due. Now the main villain of this movie that Wonder Woman is searching to kill is Ares. Now Wonder Woman is under the impression that Ares has some sort of control over humanity, and that's why it has gone to shit. But Ares tells her that he just whispered an idea into people's ears every now and then, and the humans willingly implemented his evil ideas. And this makes her realize that humanity is not as innocent as she thought. And this is a revelation that devastates her, as it goes against everything she believed in. And unlike Captain Marvel, Wonder Woman didn't need to say this out loud. She showed it with a very human and emotional reaction. Captain Marvel, on the other hand, wasn't allowed to demonstrate this with an emotional reaction, as again, that would have gone against this movie's interpretation of a strong female character. So, going back to the villains for Wonder Woman, they are by by no means iconic and memorable, and they so easily could have been terrible. But the actions they commit, and the effects it ends up having on Wonder Woman is well written and superbly executed. As for the villains in Captain Marvel, for a large chunk of the movie, we have the Skrulls. Now the Skrulls start off somewhat intimidating, but as soon as they spend a couple hours on Earth, they start to loosen up a lot, and the whole intimidation factor they initially had was completely gone. They are just so relaxed and calm throughout the whole movie, and that was very off to me. I mean, if they're supposed to be more laid-back kind of characters, then they should have been introduced that way, but they weren't. The main scroll started off like he was going to blow stuff up and wreak havoc, but then he starts drinking a milkshake and makes a joke about sugar. It's very wacky and nonsensical, and the makeup and prosthetics 
I just wasn't drawn into their design. I mean, they look like a species out of the old Star Trek TV shows, and for a big budget movie, I would expect the prosthetics to look more creative and interesting than this, but they are very bland. Now the scrolls do something about an hour into the movie, and as soon as they do, it makes you look back at all the trouble they were giving Captain Marvel and Nick Fury, and it makes you wonder, if you are willing to go about things in a civilized manner, then why are you causing all this damage and infiltrations when you could have gone about solving your problems in a much simpler and less deadly way? It really brings the whole scroll part of the movie into question. And we find out that the Kree are the real villains in this movie, and when they show up in a surprise twist, I already saw it coming. It was so predictable, and as far as their motivations go, it was some of the most laziest writing I have ever seen. These really are some of the worst villains in the entire MCU, and this really baffles me because Marvel have been greatly improving with their villains with Vulture, Killmonger, Thanos, and even sorts of villains like Ghost, but with Captain Marvel, they went back to their old ways and gave us some truly pathetic villains. And when compared to the villains that morally challenged our hero in Wonder Woman, the lackluster and cliched villains fell very short in Captain Marvel. And I can easily say with the utmost confidence that the movie with the superior villains is Wonder Woman. Now both of these movies are based in different time periods, and this affects both of their tones and their stories. Or at least it does in Wonder Woman. In Captain Marvel, the time period it's based in is used for jokes and 90s references, but it has nothing to do with the story or the film's visual style. Wonder Woman, of course being based in World War I, has a really nice muted colour part to it, which is very reminiscent to the visual style of that time era and movies that take place during historical wars, although it does make sure to highlight the colours of certain objects and artefacts in the environment to refrain from keeping it overly grim, and the visual style for Captain Marvel is very dull. I'm sure you have heard this a lot from other reviewers, and it's true. Unlike the rest of the Marvel films, Captain Marvel lacks a visual style, and it really does look like it could have been directed by anyone. As for the soundtrack in both movies, in Wonder Woman is composed by Rupert Gregson Williams, who is fast becoming another one of my favourite composers after his surprisingly epic soundtrack for Aquaman. And he composed this Wonder Woman movie soundtrack too, and it's very good. But after hearing the soundtrack that Hans Zimmer had composed for Wonder Woman in Batman vs Superman, this soundtrack feels a lot more flat in comparison. So the soundtrack is decent, but it's not great, and certainly doesn't hold a candle to Gregson's later work on Aquaman. That being said, it still has that kick-ass Wonder Woman theme from Hans Zimmer, and it is awesome. And the music for Captain Marvel was just standard Marvel music. It was uninspired, didn't add to the movie in any way, did not give Captain Marvel an iconic and memorable theme of her own, and was all around pretty lifeless. And this really does surprise me when you take into account that Marvel has done a great job with their recent soundtracks for both Black Panther and Infinity War. I thought they were on the path to putting more work into their soundtracks, but this feels like a huge step back. And funnily enough, there is a point in this movie where it plays some pop songs, one of them being No Doubt I'm Just a Girl, and this fails on two levels. For one, this is obviously a song that is meant to hammer in the fact that Captain Marvel is a strong female character. Again. But the second reason this didn't work is because it took this scene which is tonally meant to be more serious and out of nowhere turned it into something goofy that you would expect from Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean that was so out of left field. Suicide Squad tried to rip off Guardians of the Galaxy with the pop songs but surprisingly when Captain Marvel used the songs it felt like an even bigger phony than Suicide Squad did. That's how out of place these songs were. Also this movie has the typical Marvel humour you have come to expect and some of the humour is funny but the rest of it is just your typical crappy Marvel jokes, and then you get jokes like this. And tell me, does this joke seem familiar to you? <laughs> Way to go Marvel, in Black Panther you incorporated a childish joke that Lego Batman used, and now you copied a genuinely funny joke from a film that is 20 years old, and somehow you made it suck. Now a problem that both Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel have in common is the effects. The digital recreation of Wonder Woman is very noticeable, and the light show that's going on in the end of the movie was just an embarrassment. And the same goes for Captain Marvel. Whenever Carol Danvers was a digital recreation, I could always tell. She would suddenly turn into a video game character, and her movements, especially when she's floating in space, would look very computerized and unnatural. The best way I can describe the tone and overall feeling I got when watching Captain Marvel is that it felt like a combination of the CW Supergirl and the 
Netflix Iron Fist series. The reason it feels like Iron Fist is because as well as just visually looking dull, this film also feels like complete filler with next to no substance. And when compared to the rest of the series in its extended universe, it is the most boring one of them all. And the reason it feels like the CW Supergirl is because of the gender politics it tries to incorporate, as well as the political Trump references it makes. Some of the aliens being refugees in particular is something that the Supergirl series aggressively tries to hammer into your head, and Captain Marvel decides to hammer it into your head too. And that's not good. When your movie is tonally reminiscent to two crappy TV shows, then you have a serious problem. And in general, Captain Marvel felt like it didn't know what it wanted to be. First it was trying to be a slightly less funnier version of the usual Marvel formula, and then it abruptly switches to the tone from Guardians of the Galaxy with the forced pop songs. And I feel this is the problem when you have two directors. It can work well in the case of the Russo brothers, whose collaboration technique is a simple matter of best idea wins, or it can just tonally go two different ways and divide your movie as both directors have two different visions rather than a singular one. And that is a big overarching problem with this entire film. The tone in Wonder Woman on the other hand knew what it wanted to be and it remained consistent from beginning to end. So the movie with the superior tone is Wonder Woman. You know, it's ironic that Wonder Woman is historically accurate with its real-life time period, whereas Captain Marvel is not even historically accurate within its own universe. The story is poorly written, the main hero is a bore, and she is always shown off as being perfect and doesn't make any mistakes. And throughout the movie's press, Brie Larson kept talking about the importance of Carol Danvers making mistakes and learning from them. And she kept saying that, but the truth is, the character never made any mistakes. And in spite of this, Marvel seemed to be patting themselves on the back with this movie, even though they have done a very poor job, especially when compared to the competition. Speaking of which, my main issues with Wonder Woman is that once you've seen it the first time, you really don't feel like watching it again, especially when you take into consideration that the climax of the movie is really the worst part of the film, and consequentially, it makes the movie end on a very bittersweet and anticlimactic note. And it still puzzles me why this Wonder Woman can't fly, she just does big jumps and that's it. Regardless, both movies strive to make their heroes strong characters, and in the end, only one of them succeeds. It's time for the scores. Wonder Woman gets a strong 7 out of 10, and as for Captain Marvel, the biggest offender is that the movie doesn't offer anything new, and its entertaining moments are very few and far between. The film isn't good, it's not even okay, it isn't even average, and that's why it gets a below average 4 out of 10. However, when you take into account the unbelievably lazy plot holes which will now affect the previous Marvel films, including my favourite one, The Winter Soldier, the score goes down by an extra point to a 3 out of 10. And the fact that they decided to incorporate the feminist angle into Captain Marvel just takes all semblance of humbleness and vulnerability away from her character. And taking away these crucial elements to her character's development, it just resulted in her being the least interesting superhero out of the entire MCU. Wonder Woman didn't do this, and as a result, we were treated to a rich character who was filled with humbleness and had feelings like a normal human being. This is a character that I want to follow in her future journeys. Captain Marvel is not. It just feels so dated. Comic book movies are moving forward and doing so much new stuff. Infinity War was the last really great Marvel movie, but after that we got Ant-Man 2 and now Captain Marvel. When the Russo brothers are not around, Marvel is really losing their touch and the competition is really starting to surpass them. We recently had Aquaman which was great and really did so much new stuff with regards to its giant epic scale and its massive world building, which we haven't seen in a comic book movie before. Into the Spider-Verse broke all the rules with regards to structuring a story and it somehow worked. And even Shazam was a ton of fun with so much heart and personality. Captain Marvel is just a bore with no charisma. Heck, even Peter Porker had more personality than she did. And that movie had like a dozen new characters to focus on. Despite what the troublemaking and manipulative media says, strong female characters have always been embraced. They have been for decades. They just need the freedom to be treated as quality characters and not as walking political statements. And in this day and age, especially with the dawn of superheroes and anime adaptations, we are seeing more and more strong female protagonists that are starting to consistently get great movies. And when you look at the forced empowerment in Captain Marvel and see the precedent it is setting for female characters, this is a major step back. And Marvel should be ashamed of themselves. Strong female characters are starting to grow in numbers and quality and Marvel, rather than continuing their success, just decided to cause some damage in a genre that was already doing great without them. 
If you want to watch a movie with a strong female lead, then go and watch Alita Battle Angel. The film is really good and takes the time to naturally develop Alita, and she is a very different character by the end of the film compared to what she was at the beginning. And she was a strong female character that was never constantly being told how strong she was. And here's a little incentive for you. I give Alita Battle Angel a very strong 8 out of 10. It might even possibly get a 9 if I watch it again. I really enjoyed it that much. Marvel has made such a point about how they made a cinematic universe over the course of 10 years, but this one movie has done such a bad job connecting the others together that it has caused ripples throughout the cinematic universe. Now when you re-watch any previous MCU movies, you will notice plot holes that weren't there before. So this movie completely fails at what it set out to do, which is to be an origin story for not only Captain Marvel, but for being the foundation that sets up the rest of the MCU. And for that, this movie completely fails. And this is one of those cases where the bad far outweighs the good. So you know what? I'm going to drop that score down from a 3 to a 1 out of 10. If the movie didn't make any of these disastrous connections to the other movies in the MCU, then it would have gotten a 3 or a 4. But the damage it was able to do to the rest of the films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, including some of my favourite ones, is enough to take this movie score all the way down. So, that's it for another video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and be sure to let me know what you thought of both Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman in the comments below. And if you want to see more Versus videos, then feel free to click that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with my future reviews, including my inevitable Avengers Endgame vs Avengers Infinity War video. As always, thank you very much for watching guys, and I will catch all of you next time. Take care.